What is up guys? 80s Revolution back here with another video. It's been a little bit. It's been about a week. We did uh, Galoobs. We wrapped up the WCW uh, slash NWA wrestling figures from Galoob. And um, I'm kind of uh, I'm kind of excited to get into this this uh, new series here. Um, earlier in my <clears throat> YouTube career, I kind of did a more of a brief, uh, less um, less introspective uh, review on the AWA Remco figures. And so tonight I'm going to give it the proper review that it deserves. And I'm going to be talking uh, slowly about all uh, four series of the AWA wrestling figures from the Remco Toy Company. So we're going to start that tonight. A um, <clears throat> couple of things first. Uh, <clears throat> sorry. <clears throat> Some uh, uh, exciting developments for me, uh, but stuff I can't talk about. There was... I, I was kind of letting you guys know that there was something going on um, in the TV world, I suppose, with me and <clears throat> my channel and, and my collection, and apparently that is going forward. Um, and when I can tell you what it is, uh, it's huge. It's uh, something completely unexpected, something that I never would have fallen into had it not been for uh, starting this silly little channel uh, nine months ago, but um, it's cool. It's it's huge, and uh, <clears throat> you know the '80s revolution and the entire collection here, or the hobby, the passion, uh, the sickness, is going to uh, hopefully be broadcast uh, on a nationwide. Uh, uh, forum audience. So anyway, <clears throat> that's probably too much uh, information, um, but uh, something cool is happening. I'm excited, and uh, it's been uh, I've I've been approved, I suppose, or chosen. So that will uh, that will come when I'm allowed to tell you. I will tell you, and uh, but it's awesome. It's pretty huge. So so that's coming up. <clears throat> what else? Um, I did an interview, uh, you, you saw that poor, poorly uh, filmed interview with Chris Seaver uh, of Midnight Kids Productions, uh, filmmaker, uh, fellow 80s nerd, and uh, you saw that interview here. I was uh, brought to his place this weekend and uh, he interviewed me and that will be up on his channel. So check out Midnight Kids Productions right here on YouTube. Uh, I don't think it's up yet, but that's okay. You can go and you can check out uh, some of his other footage. Uh, you can learn more about his idea of this awesome concept called It Crept from the 80s, which is sort of a, a store slash video store slash hangout slash video game, sit around, chat, store, everything, buy stuff, trade stuff. I don't know. It's kind of it's kind of like an 80s hodgepodge hangout place and that's uh one of the ideas kicking around his brain so go learn more about that on midnight kids productions channel here and hopefully in the next few days he will upload the video with yours truly and you can you can check that out as well what else um <clears throat> pickups uh my my little partner here is not uh is not down here with me tonight he's sleeping because it's uh, 10.30 when I'm filming this, so um, I'm, I'm holding off on the pickups. I don't have a whole lot of stuff, but I do have a few things uh, that I can show you that I've picked up since my last pickup video. Again, nothing, nothing too extreme, except for this. A little sneak peek. Ready? Check it out. What, what did I buy? What did the 80s revolution spend $79.99 on in Toys R Us because I'm insane? You'll have to wait and see. Uh, but if you, uh, if you caught a quick glimpse of this, then maybe you know what I bought. 
and what I have proudly uh, donned. I don't know. So we'll do pickups in the next couple of days. Me and the boy will uh, we'll go through some pickups that I've grabbed. So let's uh, let's get right into the the Remcos. Uh, the um, so the so the AWA uh, back in the eighties there was the sort of the big three organization, and with um, in more modern times, you guys pretty much experienced the big two, WWF and NWA slash WCW at the time. So with that Monday Night Wars thing, uh, in the late nineties, ECW jumped in, and we sort of got a big three. Well, back in the 80s, the original big three was the WWF, the NWA, and the AWA, pretty much in that ranking order as far as exposure and popularity. Uh, the AWA was a, um, uh, what is it, Mid Midwest or middle, I don't know, it was in Minnesota. It was based out of Minnesota. They did a lot of shows in Las Vegas at the Showboat. Uh, they had a major TV network deal with the AW, with uh, ESPN. And uh, AWA uh, was a, a very good competitor to the WWF and the NWA in their heyday. Um, uh, you know, they had some super cards. They had some pay-per-view quality events like a WrestleMania or a Starcade. Um, but still definitely number three out of those top three federations that I talked about never really climbing above the NWA or even getting close to the WWF, but still had a major fan base, and they were a national, nationally known organization, like I said, with a TV deal on ESPN. And I have very fond memories of the AWA. Uh, they were on after school, so on weekdays, and best, this is back before I knew you know, about syndication and, and things like that, so all I knew was that the AWA was on TV every single day. Uh, how could that happen? Well, you know, either they were repeats or, um, you know, they weren't putting on uh, next to live shows or, or really, you know, they just had a straight run on Monday through Friday on ESPN. And I think later on in the 80s, they started alternating on ESPN between the AWA and World Class Championship Wrestling out of Texas with Devon Eriks. Uh, because I remember that being on at 4 o'clock on ESPN after school during the week. So, guys that the AWA made famous, some names that you'll certainly recognize. Uh, Kurt Henning, uh, who went on to become Mr. Perfect, of course. Uh, Nick Bockwinkle, uh, Stan Hansen, uh, Jerry Lawler, later on during the uh, final years of the AWA, was their world champion at one point. And uh, so, the AWA had its, had its moment. Uh, it died a very sad, slow, painful death in the late 80s and early 90s. Uh, with the AWA finally shutting down its doors in around late 1990 or early to mid-1991. Lost their TV deal, of course, uh, was hemorrhaging money, and the company was basically uh, going under, which it ultimately did. But, uh, the big player, WWF, the big player, the NWA, when it came to action figures... The AWA was first to release wrestling action figures. Not by much, but the AWA Remco figures absolutely came out slightly before the WWF LJN figures, thus becoming the first nationally produced uh, wrestling figures. There were some early figures produced in Japan, certainly not as popular, um, and very cornered to that particular market. But the AWA linked up with the toy company Remco and produced the first U.S. wrestling figure line in 1985, shortly before the LJNs came out. And because wrestling figures were relatively new uh, concept, wrestling although not a new concept at all, was, was really gaining in popularity for the first time ever, getting these national TV deals. The WWF, of course, was taking off. Um, but I think toy stores were still a little leery, so uh, 
AWA wrestling figures were released in smaller stores like Kmart and Woolworths, uh, not making it till Toys R Us until later in the run, which was a brief run, but uh, later in 1986, they started showing up at Toys R Us. So my first experience with AWA is walking into a Kmart and seeing these figures. Now, I got LJN figures first. Uh, as you recall, the AWA, or the, the first WWF figures I got was in uh, mid to late 85 with uh, getting Big John Studd and, and Andre the Giant. And then in Easter of 1986, that's not true. Let me back that up a little bit. Early 85 was when I got John Studd, or when I got Hulk Hogan and Andre the Giant, sorry. My first LJN figures were Hogan and Andre in early 85. Then, so about January, February. Then in, uh, for Easter 85, I got the Road Warriors. Of course, the Easter Bunny, uh, since I was a toy nut back in the day, like I'm not now, uh, the, um, the Easter Bunny would bring me toys in addition to candy. So I got the Road Warriors. And got really introduced to the AWA Remco figures and absolutely loved them. They're a great, great figure line. Um, so in 1985, uh, two series were released, uh, cleverly named Series 1 and Series 2. So I'm going to talk about Series 1 right now. So Series 1 consisted of... Uh, so the AWA figures, when they uh, were, were released on two packs, uh, so two packs and three packs, actually, which was huge at the time because LJNs came out single-carded, single, single carded, so we didn't really see tag teams until later on with the LJNs. But right from the start, you'd get two figures. Not for the price of one. I believe that AWA figures were around $7.99, $8.99 uh, for a two-pack. Of course, they're smaller than the LJNs, but... So you'd get two figures, which was amazing because... Of course you needed two figures if you were going to have wrestling figures. What would be the point of just one? So they were released on two packs. Uh, later on, they were released in three packs. And then uh, the very last series, the Matt Mania series, were uh, single cards. So let's take a look at, this, at the two packs. Uh, the first, I'll, I'll show you the loose ones. Uh, first, we have a very regional tag team. Um... You know, when you look at when you look at the names released for the AWA line, it, you know, some of these characters <clears throat> would have never seen an action figure if it weren't for the AWA Remco line. And uh, eh, these both these guys went on to become different characters, and uh, they had action figures released later on in there in you know the run of wrestling figures, but at the time. Uh, this tag team would not have gotten released or any recognition if it weren't for the Remco line. I'm talking about the fabulous ones, uh, Steve Kern and Stan Lane, who basically got their start teaming together in about 1982. And uh, they, they wrestled regionally. They wrestled in um, Continental Wrestling Association, the CWA. Uh, they wrestled in Florida Championship Wrestling. They wrestled in uh, Southwest Championship Wrestling, uh, which was a little organization run by a guy named Joe Blanchard, who's the father of Tully Blanchard, uh, who was one of the original Four Horsemen. But, I mean, they got into WCCW for a little bit, and they showed up in the AWA around 1984, and they were there a year. So they were part of the first series of Remco figures released. I'm talking about Steve Kern and Stan Lane, the fabulous ones, who were, I mean, so when you look at these guys, look, they got the, the bow ties and the suspenders with no shirts on. So what do you think when you see these guys? You think Chippendales, right? Well, Chippendales was this 80s, this big boom in the 80s of male strippers. And uh, so this is kind of the Chippendale gimmick. And the fabulous ones played that. I mean, they were they were pretty boys. Um, they, they were marketed towards females. Um, that was probably a large portion of their fan base. And, uh, 
and they got some action figures, complete with the bow tie and suspenders, which is pretty awesome when we're talking about accessories for figures in 1985. I mean, you recall the LJNs when they were first released, the first five, the only accessory you got was Hogan's belt, then we got into hats and things like that, but right from the start, the Remcos were giving you awesome accessories. And the only negative thing about these figures is they pretty much all have the same body type, this overly muscular, shredded, ripped body. Uh, but uh, who cares? I mean, these are great figures, and they have fantastic playability because the only thing that moves are the arms and the legs, and I like that in a figure. So Steve Kern, Stan Lane, uh, went on, of course, Fabulous Ones lasted about maybe uh, 86, 87. Uh, they bounced all around. They did some time in the NWA. Uh, so back back then, you know, like you weren't locked down to one particular organization unless you were a huge name. And you would bounce around and you'd bounce around to different territories and you'd show up in Memphis or you'd show up in Florida and you'd come on their TV show and talk a lot of stuff and get into a feud with somebody and you'd leave. And that was just kind of the way. So the Fabulous Ones were definitely, um, you know, veterans when it came to kind of bouncing around different organizations. They both went on to bigger and better things, uh, more money and more exposure. Uh, Stan Lane eventually uh, became part of the Midnight Express in the uh, NWA, teaming with Bobby Eaton. And... Uh, and he also had a little bit of a run in the WWF when uh, WWF and Smoky Mountain teamed up. And he teamed up with Tom Pritchard and they formed the Heavenly Bodies. Uh, Steve Kern, you might recall, has actually a few figures. He has the uh, Skinner figure from WWF in their, the peak of their cartoony, gimmicky character era. He played Skinner. Uh, and he was also a doink. He was the second doink after... Uh, um, Matt Bourne left the WWF. Steve Kern took over the Doink character. So, both going on to bigger and better things, both changing. Well, Stan Lane never changed his gimmick. He went from Fabulous One to Midnight Express, so he always kind of maintained that thing. Chippendale Steve Kern turned into like a Florida gator hunter and then a clown. So, quite a career path for. Mr. Kern. But here you are with the Fabulous Ones, part of Series 1 AWA Remco's, released in 1985. Uh, second tag team, which of course came as a two-pack. Uh, we're talking about the Road Warriors, Hawk and Animal. Uh, I've already talked about Hawk and Animal when I did Hasbro reviews. Uh, if you guys are wrestling fans, you know who Hawk and Animal are, you know who the Road Warriors are, and you know what they have done. Uh, but in the AWA specifically, they were uh, one of their one of their most dominant heel tag teams. And the Road Warriors have always been better as bad guys. Um, but when they first came out, their look and their gimmick was relatively new. And so the Road Warriors would hit the ring and clean house and pummel people. They were very stiff and just they really looked like they were beating the heck out of these guys and i'm sure at some points they were and they're two pretty legitimate badasses at the time uh hawk and animal and uh they were uh fortunate enough to become awa tag team champions uh defeating a team called crusher and uh i think it's jerry blackwell i think I think. I think they defeated Crusher and Jerry Blackwell to win the AWA Tag Team titles in about 1984-85. Um, and, and they were so popular that they would split time between the AWA and the NWA. And so they would show up in the NWA territory as well. And they would actually go back and forth between the two territories. Well, AWA did not have as much financial backing as NWA. And, of course, Jim Crockett uh, offered the Road Warriors a boatload of money, or more money than the AWA, to become exclusive to them. And so they finally left the AWA around 86 and became full-time in the NWA, continuing their run of success, continuing flip-flopping between good guy tag team and bad guy tag team. Um, and something that I 
we probably knew would happen at some point, but I was definitely surprised to see them jump to the WWF in about 90 or 91, and it immediately uh, continued their domination, uh, winning the WWF Tag Team title. So when titles actually meant something back in the day, uh, the Road Warriors actually won tag team titles in all three major organizations, which has not happened or did not happen uh, back then. That, that was very rare and unheard of. Um, tag team championships or championships in general meant a heck of a lot more uh, than they do now. Um, in fact, um, I think from like 1965 to 1984 there were only 12 uh, WWF heavyweight champions and then in that same time span you know from like uh, when Hogan first lost it in 87 88 when Hogan first lost it from like 88 on another 12 15 years there was you know almost triple that and and now it's you know absurd titles are changing all the time so anyway little rant uh, so here are the uh, here's the AWA Remco Road Warrior figures again decked out with accessories they have those neck collars and they have removable chaps and they came with championship belts and I'll show you those a little bit later but very very great looking figures in fact these, uh, I have a little soft spot for these because they were the first Remco's that I got as a kid. And I do remember actually finding them Easter Sunday, 1985. And I remember the hiding spot. How's that for psychotic memory? AWA Remco Road Warriors, Hawk and Animal. Hawk, of course. Sadly, passing away in 2003. Um, an interesting two-pack. Uh, this was the first set. Well, so we, I did two tag teams, so they released the two tag teams together. But they also released, like, a bad guy, good guy set as well. And um, this one is Rick Martell, who was the AWA champion at the time these were released. And his opponent for the night... Baron Von Raschke. So I'll tell you a little bit about Baron Von Raschke, who, you know, played this German, you know, character, um, of course, hailing from Nebraska. And uh, Baron Von Raschke is 76 years old today. Uh, he was wrestling well into his 50s. Uh, Baron Von Raschke was old in like 1985. 1986. He was already old. And he never, ever looked young. He was always old. That's what I remember of Baron Von Raschke. Uh, so here we have Rick Martell, the AWA champion, and Baron Von Raschke, his opponent in the main event. Take a look at that belt. I've talked about this before. So this, this is the belt that came with the AWA figures. And if you know your belts, that looks a heck of a lot like the NWA world title. But this was the belt that came with Rick Martell and also the belts that came with the Road Warriors and the two-pack tag team set. So we got Baron Von Nashke's robe. Rick Martell comes with his little ring jacket. Great, great figures. Of course, I don't think Baron Ra Von Nashke was this shredded even at 19, but what are they going to do? Uh, another uh, sort of interesting, interesting release. Uh, this this pairing makes no sense. Uh, these guys really never crossed paths at all. But we got uh, the NWA World's Champion, of course. You know my favorite, Ric Flair. Uh, he was paired up with Larry Zabisco in a two-pack. Which, again, to me, makes no sense because these guys were not in each other's lives in 1985. Um, and I've talked about this before. I talked about this early on with the Remcos. Uh, the fact that Ric Flair uh, was even included in, in, in an AWA toy line uh, is pretty interesting. There was a slight merger between the NWA and the AWA in 85. And they started a little co-promotion called Pro Wrestling USA. Uh, where the stars of the AWA and the stars of the NWA 
pretty much joined the same roster, and they ran a bunch of shows, and they had actually a TV deal, and they had maybe 15 TV shows. And then Egos took over, and nobody could agree, and Pro Wrestling USA died. But it's actually a pretty awesome idea. It was really one of the first modern merges of two companies, so you could see, you could potentially see all these dream matches that actually never happened. But Ric Flair, complete with robe, NWA championship title, and his opponent for the evening, Larry Zabisco. If you're not familiar with Larry Zabisco, um, you might recognize him more from his time in, in WCW or NWA when he was teaming with Bobby Eaton. Uh, and then he was a commentator on Nitro. Uh, before the AWA, Zabisco was involved in one of the most famous angles of all time when he turned on his teacher uh, and trainer, Bruno Sammartino, and got into a little feud with him. Uh, quickly, the last set of uh, Series 1 is the High Flyers, Greg Gagne and Jim Brunzel. Uh, Greg Gagne's father is Vern Gagne, who was a huge part of the AWA. Um, I'm sure he was involved in the promotion and things like that. Uh, but he is the son of Greg Gagne, or Vern Gagne. And Jim Brunzel, you will remember from the Killer Bees tag team in the WWF, where he teamed with uh, Brian Blair, and they were the Killer Bees. But this was just your average, ordinary, babyface, high flyer, jumping around tag team. Um, and then they had success as the, as the face team of the AWA at the time. And they got pretty awesome jackets, good, good looking uh, tag team, and they they both always wore these uh, these tie dye trunks, and so they captured those pretty well as well. So, Greg Gagne, Jim Brunzel, the High Flyers. We'll come back with series two. I'll show you some of the carded figures that I have, uh, including we'll, we'll we'll wrap up series one a little bit, talk about some of the uh, variants, and uh, come back. We'll do part two real soon. Thanks.